In this video, we're going to take a look at the concept of vis viva, which in Latin uh, means the life force, and it might more appropriately be pronounced vis viva, but that sounds funny, so I'm not going to say that. All right, here's the guy that popularized it. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, the famous German philosopher in the 1600s, he was a friend of Isaac Newton's uh, who turned a bitter enemy because uh, Leibniz and uh, Newton, they co-invented calculus, essentially. Um, not that they worked together, but that they are both credited as discovering calculus independently of each other at the exact same time. And then they got in a fight over who actually invented it. Um, in the immediate time frame, Newton won. Leibniz later was kind of given the credit that he deserved uh, in like the 1900s. Anyway, he liked to smash things. He was an adherent to uh, what you might call the particle model. The particle model was something made famous by Rene Descartes um, that said everything in the universe is sort of like pool balls on a pool table, just sort of running into one another. And all of the chain reactions of collisions explain the, the macro things that we see in the universe, in the world, like you, me, and I don't know, love. Anyway, Leibniz was super interested in the conservation of a certain quantity. He noticed that the product of mass and velocity squared was always conserved in collisions. This will make a little bit more sense when we talk about collisions in our unit on momentum. Uh, Leibniz differed from Descartes, who believed that the product of mass and velocity was always conserved. We call that momentum, um, and we deal with it in our unit on the conservation of momentum, which will be next. In any case, Leibniz called this product of mass and velocity squared, the thing that he saw that was conserved in all these collisions, he called this the vis viva, or the life force. So in his mind, if one atom in the universe were to run into another atom, it would transfer its life force to that object. And for him, that life force is the product of mass and velocity squared. The Leibnizians were people who followed this idea and were always looking at the product of mass and velocity squared in their physical analysis. Gaspard Gustav Coriolis was the most prominent Leibnizian. This is much later, a few hundred years later. He was, uh, you know, deep into the Industrial Revolution, and he was interested in the concept of work and how it could be used to analyze this product of mass and velocity squared. So in this book called Calculation of the Effects of Machines, he coined the phrase work to describe what James Watt and all those other scientists were doing to discuss what a steam engine, you know, or something like that could do, the product of force times distance. And he related it to the product of mass and velocity squared in this thing called the network principle, which we're going to go through together with simple algebra. So the network principle is as follows. Basically, you're going to take the concept of network. Network is net force times distance. Only we're going to call this delta x just to make it a little bit more recognizable to ourselves. Um, and then we're going to replace the net force with mass times acceleration because the net force is always equal to mass times acceleration. Now, this A times delta x, we're going to find that in a motion equation that doesn't have time. The ain't got no time equation to A delta x plus V naught squared. We're going to rearrange this equation for a delta x, so v squared minus v naught squared over 2. Okay, so that's a delta x. We're going to plug that in to our network equation. Just like that. And then I'm going to do a few distributions. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the 1 half and factor in the m. It'll make sense in a little bit. V m v squared minus m v not squared. And then you can see that the network has now been related to the vis viva or the life force. Um, only it's related to, this is kind of weird, half. The difference between mv squared minus mv naught squared. Well, that would be the life force at the end minus the life force at the beginning, or the vis viva at the end minus the vis viva in the beginning. What we do now, we don't call these the life force or life forces. Um, instead, what's more common is we factor in the one half and we consider one half mv squared minus one half mv naught squared. We consider those their own quantities. So before you ask, Mr. Larson, any more writing? Yeah, but let's get this down. This is the network principle. The network principle is that the net force times the displacement is equal to half the mass times the final velocity squared minus half the mass times the initial velocity squared. So the reason why we look at these two things is they represent for us states of work. 
we call them kinetic energies. So we'd have K minus K naught, where a K is half of the mass times the final velocity. This is what's called a kinetic energy. The network is therefore equal to K minus K naught, or another way of saying that is that the network is equal to a change delta of kinetic energy, because final minus initial is delta. The kinetic energy is called the kinetic energy because it's related to the motion or the kinesis, right? The velocity of the object. Um, and now we have an idea that whenever you're doing a network, you're going to get an increase or a decrease in this kinetic energy, the speed of the object. The person that first called this a kinetic energy instead of a life force was Lord Kelvin, the person who developed the Kelvin temperature scale with James Prescott Joule, who we named the units of work after, Joules. Um, and he actually thought that it was more appropriate to call this one half mv squared a kinetic energy. So he used the phrase kinetic energy, um, and we're going to talk about why he did that in another video. All right, so again, a kinetic energy, let's do a quick example. Let's say you had a ball of one kilogram flying through the air at a velocity of 10 meters per second. If I wanted to find the kinetic energy of that ball, then I would do half of its mass, one kilogram, times its velocity, 10 meters per second, the whole thing squared. Okay, so that's 0.5 times 100, or 50. And what we're going to get is kilogram meter squared per second squared. But I'm going to rewrite that instead as a kilogram <clears throat> meter per second squared times a meter, or a newton times a meter, or, you guessed it, a joule. So, yeah, kinetic energy is in joules, the same thing as work. Uh, and actually, sometimes we call this a state of work. It's like a snapshot of how much work is being done at a certain moment in an analysis or in the motion of an object. All right, so the work kinetic energy equation, that's what the network principle is. So if you haven't written this down yet, know that that's what we call it in physics textbooks. And it can simply be stated sigma w equals delta k in its shortest form. But in its longest form, the network sigma w is really net force times delta x. And the change of kinetic energy can be written as 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv naught squared. So these are kind of the two equations that you want to um, commit to memory. And here's what sucks. These are not on the AP equation sheet, but they're very, very useful. The reason why they're useful is because they help you understand that works correspond to a change of kinetic energy, meaning there's either an increase or a decrease of kinetic energy. An increase of kinetic energy would mean the object speeds up. A decrease means it slows down. A net work that is positive would give you an increase of kinetic energy or it speeds up. A network that is negative would mean a de decrease in kinetic energy and so it slows down. This will make a bit more sense when we're working on some problems together. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, okay. Well, let's just go on then. Okay. You push a 50 kilogram trash can across the road with a constant force frictional surface. After you push for 2.25 meters, the speed of the trash can is 3 meters a second. Assuming you started from rest, what is the force that you're pushing with? All right. So in this problem, I have a box or a trash can. It's being pushed across a frictionless surface with some force F. We don't know what it is. And we know that it initially has a speed of 3 meters per second. And, oh, I'm sorry, initially has a speed of 0 meters a second because it comes from rest. And then eventually, once it has traveled a distance of, we'll call that delta x now, 2.25 meters, now the box is traveling, same force, we don't know what it is but with a velocity of 3 meters a second, which we can represent here with a little vector if we want. Okay, so way, the way that we find the force that you're pushing with is you recognize that if there's, if there's no friction, then that push is your net force. 
And now rather than trying to use x and v and v naught to figure out an acceleration to relate the mass times the acceleration and get the net force, you could instead use our new equation, the network or sigma f times delta x is equal to 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv naught squared. Okay, so the beauty of this equation is v naught is zero, so this whole term disappears. And in order to solve for the net force, all you have to do is divide both sides by delta x. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this real quick. And instead of writing 1 half mv squared, now I'm going to write it mv squared over 2. So it's a little easier for me to see where the delta x goes. I would take sigma f, and then it would be mv squared over 2 delta x. So that's how you find the net force. Take the mass, 50 kilograms, times the velocity, 3 meters a second, square it. Divide that by 2 times 2.25 meters. Okay, so 50 times 9 is going to give you 450 kilogram meters squared per second squared. And 2 times 2.25 is 4.5 meters. Of course, one of the meters cancels. You're up to the kilogram meter per second squared, which is a newton. And 450 over 4.5 is a wonderful number. 100 newtons. So now you know that's the force that you were pushing with. All right, in this problem, the two kilogram box is moving four meters a second when it begins to slide across a rough surface. After sliding three meters, the box comes to a stop. What is the force of friction? All right, so similarly here, you have a box moving across a rough surface. As it moves to the right, a distance of three meters. Sorry, we're calling it delta x for now. You can say d. It, it's fine, it doesn't matter. Uh, it initially has a velocity of 4 meters per second, but at the end it will come, come to a rest, so the velocity is 0. And I know that while it is moving, the only force acting on it is a force of friction backwards. Nothing is pushing it forward as it moves forward. Friction is slowing it down. Okay, so that means that the force of friction is the net force. There's nothing to act against it. It's the only thing that's slowing the box down. And so when I want to find the net force, I'm sorry, when I want to find friction, I just need to find the net force. So I look at my net work equation. 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv naught squared. And take a look to see if anything is zero. The final velocity is zero. So I would get rid of that whole term and be left with net force times delta x equals negative 1 half mv naught squared. I am trying to figure out what uh, the friction is, so I just do exactly what I did last time and solve for the net force. Only this time I'm going to get a negative number. Negative mv naught squared over 2 delta x. So negative 2 kilograms times 4 meters a second, the whole thing squared, over 2 times 3 meters. It's going to give me Negative, what's 4, 4, 16, 32, 32 over 6. Oh gosh, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's 6 gives them 35 times. And then I got 2, so I guess 5, you got 5 point, oh, sorry. 5.3 repeating newtons, negative. 5.3 repeating, and that is your force of friction, which makes sense because the friction is in the opposite direction of the velocity, so you should get a negative answer. Next question, and the last one. You drop a 12 newton ball from a height of 20 meters. What is the velocity of the ball before it hits the ground? You might be able to solve this with your free fall motion equations, but let's real quick just talk about how we can use the work done by gravity to solve this. Okay, in this case, the only force acting on the object is mg as it falls down. And in the beginning, the initial velocity is zero. At the end, it is going to be some number that we want to find. Well, I know that the change in the height, in this, guy, in this case you can call it delta y if you wanted to, uh, or you could call it d or h, um, it is going to fall a height of 20 meters. I'm going to leave it positive because it's in the same direction as the weight and also the direction of the velocity. So I want that, I'm just going to get a positive velocity and I need to remember that it's going down. Anyway, the net force is 
the weight. So when I use the network equation, I'll rewrite it with a delta y, I can find the final velocity by first getting rid of, I'm oh, sorry, that should be v, not, getting rid of that kinetic energy in the beginning because it's zero, v not is zero. Uh, and now to figure out v, I'm going to take this equation, sigma f delta y equals one half mv squared, and I'm just going to solve for v. So two times the net force times the change of height. Then I divide by m to get rid of the mass. Last thing, I take the square root, and now I find the velocity by doing the square root of, um, remember that the net force is actually, I can write this off to the side, mg. So 2 times, oh, it tells you in newtons. You don't even have to convert it. 2 times 12 newtons times delta y, 20 meters over, oh, the mass. you got to find the mass. Okay, well, uh, assuming that the... Assuming that the acceleration of gravity is 10, we'll call G 10, then the mass should be 12 kilograms. Um, and you know what, this is actually a good point to, to talk about this. If I was going to rewrite this to mg delta y over m, you'd find that that 12 actually ends up canceling out. So if you put in your calculator 2 times 10 meters a second squared, times delta y, which is 20, you'll get the same correct answer. Square root of, what, 400 is um, 20. 20 meters a second. And now we're done. Congratulations, you can now use the network principle or the work kinetic energy equation. I, I don't know where my cat is.